Nabu, Nabu, Nabu. Come on, Nabu. What's he doing? What's he doing following me with that stick? Oh, is the American again? Oh, great. Today, our discussion centers on the Hunyadi family. Onwards to the Duna Kanya. Bats and Najmarosh. Just a hop and a skip away from Budapest down the Danube Bank. Look at the lovely statues. Wonderful. And here's the Batsy panels. Very interesting city, Bats. Never quite properly explored it yet, but I'm excited to say the least. So we've arrived here in Bats. It's down on the banks of the Danube, further outside of Budapest than the Oypesh direction. I've driven through here many times on the way to Visegrad, which we will shall explore later, or Najmarosh rather. Look at the Batsy panels. Very, very interesting. Huh. It's a mix between the old and the new in Bats. Boik. Boik. Apparently it's Boik, not Boik. Boik. <laughs> Boik was the first named leader of the Hunyadi family. And it was him that started the clan in Hunyad in Romania. Boik, Boik. <laughs> boik, 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 indeed. Oh, wow. There's some like ruins over there in the distance. Yeah, yeah, it is. This is super cool. Wow. We're heading to a vegan restaurant, part of what they're calling the Vatsi Revolution. You can see the old historic downtown district is beautiful, nice pastel colors, some ruins in the center, even a tourist train. You never would have known walking in towards the panels that Vats had so much antiquarian beauty in its midst. Saint Mihai Templom. Me and Templom are uh, Saint Mihai Templom. I don't know. I'm a Templom. Uh-huh. Fahirak Templom. Uh-huh. Fahirak. Jido. Israelita. Israelita. Again? Again? Ot? Ot? Baroshaza. Baroshaza. City Hall. City Hall. Baroshaza. Chinaloka. Videota. Vatsiro. Meta. Najona. Erkes. Tötenelem. Fogod látni Szent Háromságtér. Jó, jó, jó. Ilyen Magyarországon csak kettő van. Vácon, és nem is tudom, hol van még egy Vácon. Persze, persze. Szép a visel, szép a nadrágat. Köszönöm szépen. Nagyon jó. <laughs> Köszönöm szépen. Szervus. Szép napot, szia. So these are the ruined remains right here of St. Michael's Church, which was built following the ravages of the Tatayarash in the mid 13th century, when German immigrants came to Vats to settle these lands, and they built this church here. And unfortunately, many years later, it was ruined, but you can see how it really provides a nice centerpiece for the beautiful pastels of downtown Bats. But today our story is not about the Tate Yarish or the Germans. It is rather about the Hunyadi family, as I've alluded to before. And we start with Voik, Voik, Voik. <laughs> at the tail end of the 14th century. Look at this fountain. The bells ringing in the distance. What else could you ask for in downtown Vats? Here's the Vats City Hall. Very, very nice. People praying in the church. That could be an extremely religious ceremony. I don't want to interrupt. Oh, look at the red pastels. Downtown Vats is surpassing all prior expectations. This is all you need to know about Boik. Boik had three sons. Two of them were named Janos. And the third one was named Boik. And of the three sons, one of them, Janos Hunyadi, Hunyadi Janos, would go on to become perhaps the most famous military commander in Hungarian history. Some of the uh, sports cars that are seen here in Vats, very, very rapid. Janusz Hunyadi begins to distinguish himself during the reign of Kiraj Zsigmond, who dies in 1437. And subsequently, his son-in-law, Albert, the first ever Habsburg Hungarian king, comes to the throne, alongside his daughter, Erzsébet. I like the lime green on the facade here. Crumbling, decrepit. He had all the same, a certain sensual energy. And the Danube comes into sight. 
with the Magyar flag billowing in the distance. So Albert II of Habsburg comes to the throne between 1438 and 1440, but he dies before his son, Laszlo, is born. The Ottomans have been pounding on the doorstep of the Hungarians, storming through the Balkans during the whole first part of the 15th century. And most of the Hungarian noblemen are not too keen on letting little Laszlo the Posthumous, little Laszlo the Posthumous, little Laszlo the Posthumous. They're not too keen to let him onto the throne. A baby against the Ottomans? Are you kidding me? Vatsi Hayo Rowing Club. Oh, this is a phenomenal door. I've never seen such a door. You can get lost in here. Yes. Oh well. And it's a big risk to trust the infant. Laszlo, who would be Laszlo V, Utadik Laszlo, with the Hungarian crown. So they offer the throne to Władysław of House Jagiello, the king of Poland at the time. And Władysław, or Ulaszlo as they call him in Hungary, he's not an old guy either, but he's slightly more experienced than an infant. I like this. Yeah. They put flowers. It's very nice. What does it mean? Nevid eat. Look your necky. Don't take them away. Be happy with them. Uh huh. I love these Vatsi cobblestones. We call them cat stones. Uh huh. Right. Much good cute, them. Uh huh. As we make our way out of Vats, we make our way into the interregnum feud between Ulaslo and Laslo. Now the Hunyadi family sided with Ulaslo, and this is where Hunyadi Janos's career in the Balkans against the Ottomans really begins to take off. And in 1442, alongside Ulaslo, as well as Jurad Brankovic of Serbia, he embarks on what is then to be known as the Long Campaign. And they get troops from Poland, and they recruit troops from Serbia, and they embark on this famous Long Campaign in the autumn of 43, 1443 that is, and the early winter of 1444. Enjoy the sultry, smooth violin strings of Lyko Felix, one of the most melodious Magyar musicians in the modern day. Oh, the romantic realization of driving down a Magyar country road. Oh, oh, this is the Nomad Bar. We're heading down into the Nomad Bar on the Danubian coastal bank of Najmarosh. Napraforgo. Napra Sunflowers. You can see some of the camping facilities in the background there. Oh, nice fruits on the trees. What are those plump fruits? Are those pears? Kurte? Wow. Kurte trees. Nomad Bar is looking to be the place to be. It's a real hippie paradise back here. It's a beautiful setting. Yeah. A really, really, really lovely place for a drink. Oh, that's fucking cool. See ya. Hello. Najan, yeah. It's amazing here. <laughs> you can imagine Janos Hunyadi on the long campaign tromping through woods just like this. Oh, a nice red balloon. What is going on here? Lovely. What a wedding we've walked into. Imagine being married beneath that altar there. The kids are about, the celebration looks to be getting just underway. Not gonna crash today, but wouldn't be a bad place to get married, let me tell you that. Hunyadi's long campaign was particularly notable because it was really the first time. It was really the first time that say the pot, say the pot, that a European force was able to withstand and actually become victorious over the Ottomans. And though they were forced to turn back at the shores of the Black Sea in the winter of 44, they finally had success boosting the spirits of European Christians palpably. Unicum, Agashag. <sighs> Mouthwash. We've got people swimming in the distance. A lovely scene here. Woohoo! At the Nomad Bar. Visegrad poking its head through the clouds. 
Really tremendous. Oh, see so ya. Yeah. Hodge Vodge. That is so cool. Mm. What a place to first touch upon the Treaty of Seged, which after the long campaign, Sultan Murad, he was a little bit, you know, caught off guard. Wow, finally, the Christians, the Westerners, they stopped me. And he was willing to make a peace treaty. So he negotiated with Hunyadi Janos and Ulaslo and Brankovic. And they said, okay, we're gonna have a 10 year peace and we're gonna give the Hungarians and the Serbians lands and the Ottomans are gonna go away for a while. Everything's, you know, as they say, copacetic. But what happens is that this guy, Cardinal Cesarini, he convinces Ulaslo that the peace treaty did not have firm standing because Sultan Murad was inherently untrustable being a heretic Muslim. Ulaslo, Hunyadi Janos, and Cardinal Cesarini plots to go on another campaign against the Ottomans, seeing how successful their first go at it was. And they decide to head out from Seged, from Buda, from Hungary, back into the Balkans to retake lands that the Ottomans had possessed now for at least half a century. And they're counting on a couple of factors to help them out. One of them is the return of the Serbian despot, Jure. Durad Brankovic. But Durad Brankovic decides not to help them out on the second go because he's made his peace with the Ottomans. His lands have been ravished over the past 30, 40 years. And he says, nah, not for me. Plus his daughter is married to the Sultan. So, you know, he's like, sorry, Hunyadi Janos, I'm gonna chill. You can't really blame him. And another thing that Hunyadi Janos and Ulaslo I were counting on was support from the Venetian fleet. But the Venetians never come. They never block the Dardanelles as was planned to cut off Murad from the Balkans. And instead, Murad's able to cross into Varna, into Bulgaria on the Black Sea because of the brilliant military mastery of Hunyadi Janos. The combined Hungarian-Polish force actually has a chance to win. But Ulaslo, being the young, somewhat reckless king, out to prove himself as he was, he makes a very immature rush into the main flank of the battle and loses his own life. But you see, when Ulaslo dies, they don't really know whether or not he's dead. His death is very mysterious in the battle, and to this day, they actually don't really know where his body ended up resting. But after two years, by the time 1446 rolls around, they say, enough is enough, we need a king. We know that Laszlo is only like six years old. This is Laszlo V, Utadik Laszlo, Laszlo the Posthumous. And so they agree to name him king. But the problem is he's being um, fostered by Frederick III in Austria. He hasn't even ever stepped foot in Hungary since his birth. Look at these Alma, Alma trees, Kurte trees. And so basically, Laszlo's invited back into the Hungarian lands and Frederick III, after a lot of wrangling and a big show of strength from the united Czech, Polish, and Hungarian forces, decides to give Laszlo back into Hungary. But Laszlo's still under 10 years old, and so they need a strong leader to rule in his stead. Oh, this wonderful, wonderful panorama of beautiful Hungarian lands, Visegrad. Yes, yes. They elect Hunyadi Janos as the governor of Hungary. They actually name him a prince, but it's a title that he never uses. And essentially at this point during his reign of governor, he is the leader of the Hungarian state. Hunyadi Janos, he's a fighter. He's a belligerent military man. And he's basically hell-bent on getting revenge on the Ottomans. Hunyadi storms back in in 1448 just south of Belgrade in Kosovo at the field of Poye. I believe in Hungarian, it is the Rez Rizko Mezu? Nemtedom. Either way, they lose, they lose, they lose at this battle, at this field, at this battle of Kosovo, the second notorious battle of Kosovo against the Ottomans. The first, of course, being in 1389, when the Serbs were vanquished by the nascent Ottoman Empire. And now they lose again, and this is the second major defeat for Hunyadi Janos. And his reputation is at an all-time low. 
We're heading into the ferry from Naj Marosh over towards Visegrad. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, fiuk esh lanyuk. That's all we have time for this afternoon. This will end up being a two, maybe even three part series on the Hunyadi Chala. There's simply too much ground to cover. Next time, we're headed to the Battle of Nandor Fehevar, Hunyadi Janos's final glory, and the martyrdom of Laszlo, that ill fated older brother of Kirai Machash. I'll see you all soon. Thanks for watching, and as always, Shetalunk Willie Bell.